Uh, well, welcome. I'd like to welcome you all to this fall's Law and Entrepreneurship Lecture. Um, this lecture is really an important event in the life of Penn Law School. Um, part of a tradition here that epitomizes, I think, our, our interdisciplinary spirit and culture at the law school. Um, while obviously there are many aspects of Penn Law that are um, necessarily traditional, I think as much as any law school uh, in the country, we seek to integrate our programs with all of the, in, whether it be in teaching or scholarship, with all of the significant areas in which lawyers um, practice. And I think there's no better example of that to, than the Institute of Law and Economics, which is the sponsor of this lecture. The Institute is physically based in the law school, but is a joint effort with the Wharton School and the Department of Economics. Um, its events bring students and faculty from all over the university, as well as leaders from the judicial community, the business community, and the legal community. Um, and the underlying philosophy of the center uh, really is um, something which has proved incredibly successful over the years, that integrating the perspectives of different professional fields as well as leaders from legal and business practice will produce some of the best insights uh, into um, the legal system. And this lecture, the Law and Entrepreneurship Lecture, I think is a wonderful example of this process. Now today, we're welcoming as this year's lecture uh, a man who truly epitomizes the ideal of the modern business lawyer, someone who the Wall Street Journal has said is, quote, arguably the country's leading banking lawyer. He served for the past decade as chair of one of our country's most prominent firms, Sullivan and Cromwell, leading it successfully through a period of remarkable growth, even during the period of the market downturn. Um, H. Raj Cohen was born in Charleston, West Virginia, but headed north for college and law school at Harvard. Now, we will forgive him this afternoon for that institutional transgression, um, but especially because his brother made the wiser decision and chose to attend the University of Pennsylvania, albeit it was our medical school where he now shares our Department of Pediatrics. Uh, Mr. Cohen, not Dr. Cohen, joined Sullivan and Cromwell right out of law school, and rather than pursuing the peripatetic life one so often sees in law and business, has spent his entire career at that firm. The choice has been critical not only for the firm and his clients, but in many respects the entire banking uh, industry. He played a central role in the market events that changed the face of the financial service industry and the economy in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, as the U.S. banking industry nationalized. Uh, during this period, he was a lead counsel in many of the major um, acquisitions. More recently, as the financial meltdown unfolded, he was the person to which much of Wall Street approached for wise counsel. Dubbed, and I quote, the trauma surgeon of Wall Street, he was the lead counsel in, in most of the major U.S. bank acquisitions and the recent government-sponsored capital raising efforts. As one publication put it, he was Wall Street's go-to lawyer during the most important months for the American banking industry since the Great Depression. As business counselor and advisor, he has been praised for his incisive intelligence as well as his wisdom. As one client put it, you just don't find that kind of emotional and intellectual package in one head. He's also known for his diligent work habits. He rises at 4.58 in the morning, I was told. That gives him two minutes to look for the faxes before 5 a.m. when he can get the financial reports. One of his diversions, 1950s rock and roll. He reportedly can answer any question you have about that period. Um, so get ready for the Q&A afterward. Um, as a result of his legal prominence, not his musical expertise, he's been named the National Law Journal by the National Law Journal as one of the decade's most influential lawyers, as well as one, uh, one of the 25 most influential people in the world of investment in banking, the only lawyer included in that group. During most of this decade, Mr. Cohen served as chairman, as I said, of Sullivan and Cromwell, stepping down in December 2009, having successfully led that firm through the financial downturn. In short, Mr. Cohen represents the ideal, the successful business lawyer epitomizing what the Institute and this lecture is all about. 
there are few people as well positioned to discuss the topic of today's lecture, the financial crisis, its aftermath and implication. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the corporate lawyer's corporate lawyer, as well as one of the great 1950s rock and roll experts on Wall Street, Raj Cohen. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, extraordinarily gracious introduction. Um, the one of those comments that really uh, helped a lot was the reference to the trauma surgeon on Wall Street, at which point one of my mother's best friends came to her and said, now you have what you always wanted, two doctors. Uh, I am honored to be here uh, with you today to discuss uh, the financial crisis, its aftermath, and its implications. And I really look forward to this presentation being interactive. I'll take questions, comments, disagreements at any time, but we're certainly going to leave time at the end. Now, I trust that I am not being unduly optimistic by including the word aftermath in the title of this presentation because it was just two years ago that the United States and much of the world were on the verge of a financial abyss. We were experiencing what I call actual contagion as the entire financial system froze. In many cases, financial institutions would no longer take the credit of each other. Uh, several leading banks were having considerable difficulty funding themselves in the wholesale deposit market. If anything, the consequences were more devastating outside the banking system. The commercial paper market and the money market funds literally shut down. Uh, the securitization markets closed. And had we plunged into a financial abyss, the consequences may not have been limited to the financial system or even the broader economy. There could have been profound social and political unrest of the type not seen since the 1930s. Uh, the demagogy of the 30s had many roots, but undoubtedly one was economic desperation. Now, we were able to avoid this catastrophe only through uh, very massive government intervention, which proved to be wildly unpopular politically, and I think we'll be seeing some of the fruits of that today, and a very large measure of luck. And we remain mired in a period of economic contraction. Accordingly, even if we are now in the aftermath of the financial crisis, a crisis of that magnitude demands thorough and comprehensive analysis. The objectives must be to reduce the potential that it will be repeated and minimize the impact if it does. Now, my remarks today are going to be divided into the two parts which the title suggested. The first is a description of the government's response to date, and the second is an overview of key implications going forward. Uh, let me start with the government's response, and that largely reflects four key causes of the financial crisis. The first was excessive risk-taking. Too many financial institutions took on too much risk as risk management proved inadequate. Second, there were serious gaps, uh, perhaps the more appropriate term is chasms, in the regulatory system. Uh, these occurred in the context of institutions that were not regulated at all, in institutions that were not regulated adequately, and in the lack of information that was available to the government. Third was the inefficiency and insufficiency of government planning for the failure of a major financial institution and the absence of an effective resolution process. And fourth was a breakdown in consumer protection. Now, the need for fundamental change in the regulatory system to respond to these causes 
understandably became of the highest priority for the administration, Congress, and the regulators themselves. Moreover, there were three factors that appear to have increased the intensity of the government's response. The first was widespread anger at major financial institutions, some real, some politically convenient. There was a virtual primordial urge for punishment that could all too be easily confused with risk abatement. The second, and to be frank, there have been self-inflicted wounds by the financial services industry. The most recent example is the numerous flaws in the foreclosure process. And third, as the policymakers considered the trade-off between a less risky financial system and the ability of the financial system to support the economy, there was a pronounced bias in favor of reducing risk. Now, this was understandable as the magnitude of the crisis suggested the need for a correction of what was perceived as a prior imbalance. The government's response has been comprehensive and rigorous, although most of the media attention has been devoted to the legislative action, the Dodd-Frank Act, there have really been three other key components, and these are changes in supervisory approach, changes in regulation, and changes in enforcement, and let me spend a few moments on each of these. There has already been a transformative pendulum swing in supervision. The new supervisory regime for financial institutions is more proscriptive, more proscriptive and intrusive, and less flexible and predictable. And there are numerous manifestations of this new supervisory approach. Let me just list a few. Capital standards are being sharply raised specific liquidity requirements are being imposed, examinations are more frequent and more extensive, the supervisors are coming in and overriding management judgments in such areas as how fast you write off loans, uh, how deep must your reserves be, and uh, if you have deferred tax assets, when do you start to write them off? Supervisory examination ratings, which are critical for how a bank operates, are being widely reduced. Now, the United States banks are ranked on a composite basis from one to five, one being the highest, and a satisfactory rating of two used to be the norm, but this has been largely replaced by a three rating, which is unsatisfactory. There is increased uh, supervisory intervention into the board and management processes, and there is a much more aggressive pr approach by the bank supervisors in defining and enforcing consumer protection laws. Turning to regulation, the key development is new capital and liquidity standards for major banks that were adopted about one month ago by what is known as the Basel Committee on Supervision. And this committee is comprised of the financial regulators in the major countries. Uh, these new standards are referred to somewhat inaccurately as Basel III, having been already Basel I and II. Now, under Basel III, uh, banks must maintain what is known as a Tier I common ratio, that is, common equity basically to risk-weighted assets of 7%. And the immediate reaction of the markets, the analysts, and the media to this capital requirement was to shrug it off or even criticize it uh, as just no big deal. But I question the accuracy of that reaction. And let me quote from the Basel Committee's own press release, which seemed not to have been picked up in the media, and it, the committee itself said, uh, large banks will need, in the aggregate, a significant amount of additional capital to meet these new requirements. Now, I think we will find that a number of major banks, both in the United States and abroad, may be confronting a significant capital deficiency under these new Basel III capital standards. Now, how could the market observers have been wrong? Well, let me suggest several reasons. First, they probably were not 
factoring in that the actual capital requirements that a bank must maintain are higher than published regulatory requirements. And let me give some examples. In the first place, both Basel III and the Dodd-Frank Act provide that systemically significant institutions, and that's a lot of them, all the major banks, uh, must have a capital surcharge above the basic regulatory capital requirement. Nobody knows what that is going to be yet, but it's not going to be 10 basis points. Second, there is likely to be a need for banks to operate with capital levels above the regulatory standards to deal with market expectations, examiner expectations, and just simply the unexpected. And if you go back over the last 10 years, U.S. banks have generally been operating with a margin above regulatory capital requirements, even well-capitalized standards of 150 basis points. The market observers may also have unduly relied on the very long transition period before Basel III becomes fully effective. The new capital requirements really don't start to phase in until 2014 and are not fully in force until 2019. But I think it is quite likely that the U.S. and other countries will shorten that transition period sh very substantially, either formally or informally. And let me explain informally. A bank is operating below the regulatory requirements. The regulator comes in and says, that's fine, you're not necessary, it's not necessary for you to be there until 2019, but we've got to make sure that you don't do anything foolish until you get there. So during that period, no dividend increase, uh, uh, no expansion, and by the way, you need to look at your compensation levels until you reach the fully phased in requirement. The bank gets the idea pretty quickly. There's also a concern, uh, which I don't think has been well recognized, uh, that this focus on Basel III capital requirements may have obscured the importance of the second aspect of Basel III, which is new liquidity requirements. And I think reliable estimates are that the U.S. banking industry as a whole has a shortfall of about $1.1 trillion dollars in meeting these liquidity requirements. And that may sound like an astonishing number, but when you look and get to page, I think it's 35, of an investor presentation, which J.P. Morgan Chase made uh, about a month and a half ago, Chase alone was about $165 billion short. Now, the third component of the regulatory response is a much more aggressive enforcement approach by both regulatory uh, agencies and law enforcement authorities. The number of enforcement actions have increased sharply, both for financial deficiencies and compliance violations, and the monetary penalties have increased almost exponentially. The largest penalties in history have recently been levied by the SEC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, the Department of Justice, and in the United Kingdom, the FSA. And we're not talking about 5 or 10 percent increments. In many cases, we're talking about adding an extra zero. Now, the fourth component of the uh, government's response is the Dodd-Frank Act. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to call it the most comprehensive and consequential legislation addressing the financial services industry that has ever been enacted in the United States. In addition to the four causes of the crisis that I previously mentioned, Dodd-Frank is designed to address a wide variety of other perceived contributors to the crisis. These include misuse of derivatives, abuses by the credit rating agencies, corporate governance failures, and failures in the securitization markets. The passage of this legislation is not by any means the end of the process. A number of the most important provisions of Dodd-Frank are not self-executing. Rather, they require implementing regulations, and that's just the beginning because there are literally hundreds of ambiguities in the language of the statute that must be resolved by the regulators. 
Now, perhaps the core of Dodd-Frank is the imposition of sharply heightened regulatory requirements on financial institutions that are deemed systemically significant. And these new requirements, which are referred to as enhanced supervision, include a number, the following, uh, capital, leverage, liquidity, uh, what are known as living wills, planning for your own dismemberment, uh, concentration, periodic stress tests, regulatorily imposed remediation, contingent cap capital, and enhanced disclosure. These requirements apply to all domestic bank holding companies with $50 billion or more in assets. That's about 25. Uh, some form of these requirements will apply to an even larger number of foreign banks with operations in the United States. And in addition, enhanced supervision uh, would apply to any non-bank financial institution that is deemed systemically significant by a new Financial Stability Oversight Council. So that's what the response has been. So in the remainder of my presentation, what I'd like to turn to is an outline of 15 implications arising from both the crisis itself and then this government response. Now the first and arguably most important implication relates to the effectiveness of the government's response. I would suggest that as a result of the response, the United States banking system should be generally safer and less risky, and this should reduce banks' financing costs and its capital costs. But the second and other side of the less risk coin is less reward. Uh, there are multiple reasons why bank earnings, particularly large bank earnings, are likely to be under significant pressure in at least the near future. And that's as a result of these regulatory uh, new requirements. And let me give some of the reasons. First of all, these liquidity requirements that I mentioned will adversely affect net interest income. Second, net interest income will also be reduced by Dodd-Frank's removal of a 77-year barrier to paying interest on demand deposit accounts by businesses. And this is just one of many provisions of Dodd-Frank which have uncertain parentage and to which little attention was paid. Uh, third, debt costs will increase. Already the credit rating agencies are reducing their debt ratings on many banks. Fourth, profitable activities such as derivatives and proprietary trading will be prohibited or restricted. Uh, fifth, large banks will pay much higher FDIC insurance assessments and a number of new uh, regulatory fees. Uh, Dodd-Frank really was an interesting exercise in figuring out who is effective in lobbying in Congress and the small banks and the insurance industry were the clear winners. Uh, a seventh, uh, consumer-based fees are going to be reduced uh, by the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection. This is a new bureau and already have been reduced by what is known as the Durbin Amendment to Dodd-Frank, which deals with interchange fees. And eighth and last, compliance and risk management costs will soar. The third implication. Although the general direction and most of the actions taken by the regulators and Congress are positive, there are inevitably flaws. Likewise, the balance I referred to between creating a safer banking system and unduly restricting banks' capability to fulfill their role in the economy may still be acceptable, but it has certainly moved closer to the margin. Accordingly, it is essential that regulators implement their multiple new regulatory tools with these key considerations in mind. And let me mention two particular areas of concern. For the first, I'm going to return to Basel III. Now in view, and I'm going to repeat this probably a couple more times as well, the extraordinary nature of the financial crisis, uh, there can be no real argument against the basic objectives of Basel III, higher capital, better capital, and more liquidity. But what is subject to challenge in Basel III is a series of calculation methodologies that are logically flawed, 
and advance objectives other than capital and liquidity. And these are objectives that are better dealt with by other means. Now, there, th this was not random. Many of these calculation methodologies were designed to promote international consensus, which is a highly desirable goal, but they have created competitive disparity and detract from overall credibility. Let me give you just one egregious example, and this relates, once again, to Basel III's liquidity requirements. In determining liquidity, a bank must assume that all the lines of credit it has provided to other financial institutions are fully drawn, 100 percent drawn. The actual percentage during the height of the crisis was less than a third. That's bad enough. Then comes the converse, which is the bank, on the other hand, must assume that its ability to draw on lines to it is zero. The other area of concern relates to the source of what I see as the fl m perhaps the major flaw in Dodd-Frank, and that is an implicit sub-theme, which is big is bad. Now, there were attempts at the outset to address this frontally by forcing a reduction in size of the big banks, breaking them up. That was rejected. But there are still some provisions that incorporate the sub-theme. A common identifier of these provisions is where Congress went beyond the administration's original proposal. Two of the most con controversial provisions of Dodd-Frank, and I'm going to explain these in a minute, what one is known as the Volcker Rule, the other the Lincoln Amendment, really embody this big is bad sub thing. The Volcker Rule, it prohibits bank holding companies from engaging in proprietary trading and from investing in and sponsoring private equity funds and hedge funds. The Lincoln Amendment prohibits depository institutions from engaging in a variety of derivative activities. Now, these prohibitions were adopted notwithstanding the absence of any showing that the activities in question were responsible for the collapse or near collapse of any bank and without any visible deliberation regarding the impact on bank profitability and liquidity. More seriously, these activities are not going to be discontinued. They may be discontinued in banks, but they will migrate to the non-regulated sector, the so-called shadow banking system, where they are likely to continue without oversight, control, or transparency. The um, fourth implication, perhaps the most well-crafted provisions in Dodd-Frank establish a special resolution arrangement for systemically significant institutions. This was very difficult to get through, but there's a Title II, and it provides a legislative framework to confront the failure of major financial institutions without what had been the Hobson's choice of either a massive taxpayer bailout or free fall insolvency of a large institution with attendant economic disaster. Now, in addition, the framework which the authors came up with also should largely eliminate the concept of too big to fail, that there are institutions that are just so large the government has to step in, and that had created competitive inequality and may have exacerbated so-called moral hazard, which let people just lend without thought. Now, there has been criticism, I don't quite understand it, that Title II did not actually end too big to fail. I, I just don't know what more Congress could have done, because the way the title works, if a major institution goes into special resolution, its shareholders are wiped out, its management is replaced, and its creditors are to be held responsible for the losses. Moreover, Dodd-Frank bars the Federal Reserve from using its special lending authority, this is Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act, to benefit a single institution. And this had been the Federal Reserve's weapon of choice uh, during the crisis uh, for rescues. Now, uh, maybe the focus is, uh, are, are creditors really going to be at risk? Uh, 
Well, the FDIC put out a uh, rule just a, a short while ago, which confirmed that it expects to hold the creditors uh, to for, responsible for the losses. And this was uh, followed within just a few days, in one case, in a week or so, in another, by the credit rating agencies reducing the credit ratings, which I had mentioned, of a number of banks on the theory that there was no longer implicit government uh, support. Now, I, it is theoretically possible that at some future time, uh, a bank or other major financial institution gets into serious trouble, and there could be emergency legislation enacted uh, to um, preserve that institution. Now, one Congress obviously cannot bind another, and that is always possible, but if you look at what has happened, I suspect it will be a very long time indeed before an administration would uh, ask Congress to take such an action, and perhaps even longer before Congress would seriously consider it, at least unless you had term limits and everybody was up against uh, their, uh, his or her term limit. Now my fifth implication, and arguably this one should have been first, the uh, m most important lesson for financial institutions is they, they must be committed to robust risk management and controls. Uh, to some extent, the new regulatory regime is going to mandate this. For example, uh, Dodd-Frank requires every larger bank holding company to have a separate risk committee at its board and for that risk committee to have a risk expert, and the obvious uh, analog is Sarbanes-Oxley's requirement for the audit committee and the audit committee expert. In addition, the regulators are going to expect more direct and proactive board and senior management participation in the risk management process. But at the end of the day, risk management cannot be legislated or regulated. It must be a function of a company's own culture, a company's own direction. And to that effect, every company should be periodically asking a number of questions, the board and senior management. Are the company's risk parameters appropriate? How do they correlate to reward? Is the company appropriately evaluating risk? Uh, do risk management personnel have necessary skills and expertise to manage risk? Is the risk management function sufficiently independent? Does the board itself have sufficient expertise to oversee risk management? And at financial companies, I would urge a number of actions, which I think many are taking. The risk management function must be staffed with some of the institution's best, brightest, and bravest, and by bravest, I mean the willingness to say no. The institution's head of risk management should have direct access to the board. The head of risk management should be a senior seasoned executive with appropriate title and appropriate compensation. And compensation and promotion for risk management personnel should be determined principally outside the business units. One last important point for, uh, I think, every financial institution. Senior management and the board must focus intently on any area of the institution producing outsized revenues or profits. Prior to the crisis, there were these business units, sometimes subunits, sometimes just trading desks that produced soaring, unbelievable profits. These areas were typically viewed as uh, uh, a uh, reason for celebration as opposed to concern, and at some institutions it appears that no one at the senior executive or board level asks the question how or why. Yet it's really rare that some business unit, some individual has discovered the magic formula, you know, spinning straw into gold, or that someone in that business unit is just so much smarter than everyone else. The usual answer is that the business unit has simply gone out further on the risk curve. And at the risk of maybe a somewhat stretched analogy, if you've got an athlete who substantially improves his or her performance, there's an immediate suspicion that the athlete is on steroids or some other performance enhancing drug. Well, excess risk is the steroids of financial institutions, but there was apparently little, if any, drug testing in the industry whether self-imposed or mandated by the regulators.
The sixth implication also relates to risk, and we're going to move a little faster with these now. Uh, the financial crisis demonstrated that the incentive compensation system at a number of institutions encouraged undue risk taking. Uh, traders and others could immediately realize huge cash bonuses if the risks paid off initially with no fear of clawback if over time it turned out that the uh, trade proved to break even or even uh, a huge loss. There is regulatory as well as internal pressure to correct for this. The seventh uh, implication is one which I think is, I'm surprised has received so little attention, and that relates to management succession planning. In a number of high profile cases during the crisis, a CEO was dismissed, but months elapsed before a successor was appointed, and the company was essentially rudderless in the uh, interim. Such a situation clearly represents a flaw in management succession planning. That planning needs to extend beyond an orderly succession where there is sufficient time to make the decision. Succession planning must include the CEOs being hit by the proverbial bus, whether literally or as a result of unexpected business developments or just personal revelations. The eighth implication is the regulators laser-like focus on consumer compliance. This is in response to an undeniable record of consumer abuse that was part of the warp and woof of the financial crisis. The regulators are enhancing their standards without real guidance. Practices that have gone on for years without being uh, questioned are now cited as legal violations. Compliance programs that have not previously been uh, criticized are described as unsatisfactory and the subject of an enforcement action. Policies, procedures, and resource allocations that were satisfactory yesterday are not today. Ninth, courts must be careful that their authority to reject settlements between financial institutions and government authorities is that that authority is used wisely. As you are probably aware, there have been at least four cases now where a district court judge has cast real doubt upon a settlement reached, whether by the SEC or Department of Justice, uh, with a financial institution. What needs to be recognized is that these settlements typically represent the result of hard-fought negotiations where the government absolutely has the upper hand. It is unlikely that any major financial institution could survive a criminal conviction and even an indictment could prove fatal. In either case, if you have a very activist judiciary in this case, it creates really double jeopardy for the institution. The tenth implication is that the current regulatory environment may create literally a once-in-a-generation opportunity for acquisitions by banks with regulatory and financial capacity, including one which was just seen, announced yesterday. Now, in order to create such an extraordinary opportunity, you need two conditions that often don't exist even independently, but you need them in tandem. And the first is external factors that encourage multiple institutions to sell all or parts of themselves. Uh, the second consists of external factors that take out a number of potential competitors. Now, as a general rule, companies only rarely take the initiative to pursue a sale. They don't want to go out of existence. It almost always requires external stimulation. And there is no more effective stimulus than the regulators coming in and suggesting that you should seriously consider selling yourself. The current regulatory environment also significantly limits potential competitors for these acquisition targets. Uh, many competitors are sidelined for reasons I mentioned earlier. I had noted that uh, so many banks are now rated three rather than two. Well, it's a lights on, lights off. If you're three rated, you're out of the acquisition game. In addition, uh, the regulators have suggested that even if your composite rating, your overall rating is a two, if you have a consumer compliance rating of a three, that may also be preclusive. 
The eleventh and related implication is the importance of thoughtful and thorough due diligence for acquisitions. At least two major financial institutions, Wachovia and Lloyd's, were brought to the brink of insolvency by misbegotten acquisitions done on the basis of time-confined due diligence. Likewise, Bank America's acquisitions of both Countrywide and Merrill Lynch were quite compressed. Duration of due diligence may also not be the only issue. Institutions have to be honest with themselves and ask the question, do we have the internal expertise, no matter how much time we have, to evaluate the issues at the target? The twelfth implication is that in the current regulatory environment, capital will be king. This goes beyond satisfying the regulatory requirements and even beyond being in a sufficiently strong financial uh, position to do normal acquisitions. Uh, companies will want the flexibility that a strong capital position provides. Many acquisitions today will need substantial cash. and you've got to have the capital reserves to get there, and the way the accounting system works in acquiring banks, you almost always wind up with a capital hole that needs to be filled. Thirteenth, strong regulatory relationships are absolutely crucial for financial institutions. It's a time of uncertainty, it's a time of doubt, and regulatory credibility will earn financial institutions the benefit of that doubt. Uh, Fourteenth, um, I previously mentioned that one of the areas covered by Dodd-Frank was corporate governance. And although Dodd-Frank doesn't really change the road map or the overall map that much, uh, it does continue three interesting corporate governance trends. The first is a transfer of power from uh, boards to shareholders. The second is increased focus on executive compensation, and the third is federal government intervention into corporate governance, a subject that has been traditionally reserved for the states. Uh, the first of these is transfer of power. Uh, that's proxy access, and that also uh, relates to uh, the transfer uh, to the federal government of power, and the executive compensation has several provisions, including, uh, say, on pay. So, 15th, this is the last implication, and I'm going to end with a key piece of unfinished business, and that is the need for international cooperation in regulating and resolving large international banks. Now, Dodd-Frank may be great on resolving a U.S. bank, but for many of the major U.S. banks, they have lots and lots of their operations outside the U.S., and many uh, non-U.S. banks have their operations here and around the world. Now, what has been evolving, developing, is what I refer to as ring fencing. This is where each country takes the business operations of the bank in its country and regulates them as if it were a freestanding, independent entity. And uh, the, if you regulate that way, you also resolve that way. Uh, this has become increasingly common among regulators and governments around the world for a couple of reasons. They have been embarrassed that out-of-country banks have uh, collapsed, leaving the local country holding the bag for local depositors, and they are frustrated by the absence of collective action. The potential consequences of ring fencing for major international banks are severe. They include higher capital requirements, higher liquidity requirements, less flexibility to serve local customers, and ultimately, it's truly greater risk. Every time you take any institution and put it in silos, there is greater risk. But the broader consequences are even greater. This practice constitutes a form of protectionism that is inimical to the free flow of funds and global banking and is likely to encourage other protectionist measures. If this process continues, we might look back 25 or 30 years from now and say this really was the holy smoot tariffs of the uh, first part of this century.
Well, I am going to stop here. I really look forward. I know this is a very distinguished audience, and I'm sure I'm going to get some uh, very interesting questions. So I'm going to look forward to those. ending remark, which is that um, unilateral action by countries may lead to the next depression. Um, is Dodd-Frank then to blame for having taken the lead on exactly that step? Um, you know, that is a very fair question, and I think uh, some of the smartest people that I know debated this, uh, should the U.S. wait? And I think the right answer was no. It was appropriate to lead. Uh, and I, I come at this from the following proposition. I think it is not likely that we will be able to have a single regulatory system which is equally acceptable around the world or a single resolution system. Um, it's there too much history, too many differences in culture, too many differences in systems. But at least for resolution, what you can do is decide which country's law applies. And if we took that step, so there were, for example, whether by treaty or some other format, every country agreed that if we had another Lehman, what law would apply when Lehman's subsidiary uh, went down in Great Britain, what would apply when Lehman's branch somewhere else went in, into insolvency, we would be making major steps. I, I think we needed to lead. Uh, I realize this can lead to a lot of unhappiness among the Europeans, but had we not led, I think we'd be sitting here with nobody having tried to in, improve uh, the regulatory environment. You mentioned that uh, you expect trading activity and traders to migrate out of the banks to the chatter banks under the Folker rule. So I would project that that will create interesting questions for the Oversight Council concerning the extent of prudential regulation. I have two questions about that process. One, do you expect it to be more technocratic or more political? And do you think the statute allows the, a sectoral rather than a firm by firm approach to drawing the line? Um, let me preface this by uh, uh, repeating uh, advice when I was asked today uh, uh, by a client how this was all going to come out on who was going to be designated as systemically significant. And I said, just having had one more meeting in Washington before that call, I was convinced I knew who was wrong, not who was right. And who was wrong was anybody who said they knew how it was going to come out because the, the regulators themselves don't know. I, I think on, with respect to the first part of that, it will be um, uh, a, a mixture inevitably of the two. Uh, it's not possible to have Washington and politics in different sentences. I mean, they, they just go together. So uh, there will be political impact. But I, I really do have a lot of confidence in the people I know in the government that they will try and do this in the least political way possible, both at the Treasury and the Fed, uh, which will be taking the lead on this. So it, it, it's not going to be perfect by any means, but I think these are individuals who will try and do, um, to, to keep the political impact to a minimum. Um, I think there is room under the statute, and in fact, I think there will be a regulatory bent to do uh, a lot of this in a sector way that makes uh, sense uh, because it's hard to distinguish among institutions. But actually, I would hope that the regulators will dig in because if you, I, I'm not so worried about who's included. I'm very worried about who's excluded. And if you do it on a broad basis, then sh sure enough, somebody's going to figure out how not to be in the group and yet to do all the activities. <laughs>
venture capital that received these funding. And uh, I've got two questions. Number one, uh, will the capital generating system of this country be sufficient to meet that demand? And if it isn't, then what would be the configuration of the capital industry? And if the, the answer is yes, they are able to meet that demand, what would be the configuration of the financial institution? Okay. Um. Let me just immediately try and deal with liquidity. I think that really is a separate issue, and there are ways to get at liquidity. Uh, and remember I said international consensus. I don't think it's an accident that uh, the impact of the liquidity standards is to increase the demand for government securities, which for the Europeans is a very desirable objective because they want to keep those government securities markets strong. Uh, but there are ways. That, that's an earnings impact. It's, it's not, I, I believe, a balance sheet impact, uh, maybe at the margins. But there are ways to deal with uh, uh, liquidity. As far as capital, uh, and who knows whether these numbers are right, but I think directionally they are. The capital shortfall in, in the U.S. banks is probably about a half trillion. 500 billion. Much of that, if the banks have even a relatively modest level of profitability, uh, can uh, be obtained through retained earnings and even with some modest dividend increases over the next couple of years. So that leaves roughly a quarter of a trillion. Uh, there are balance sheet acts, a actions, reduction of balance sheets, uh, sales of non essential businesses. Uh, which can um, further reduce that. And so we're down to, you know, again, roughly maybe somewhere between 100, 200 billion, and there is, I think, more than enough capital generating capacity. Uh, but uh, that will be, and to your second and quite good point, that that will be uneven. And uh, those who are you know, most, are most needy of capital will find it the most challenging, and that will be one of several factors which I think will lead to consolidation and perhaps substantial consolidation of the banking industry over the next five to ten years. But it's going to be a different type of consolidation. Uh, there are such strong barriers in Dodd-Frank and in the regulatory uh, purview against the very largest institutions growing more that th we're going to see, I think, most of this in the middle-sized banks as they buy their smaller brethren and, or combine uh, themselves. And so if, if I were to do a prognostication over the next five to ten years, that's uh, what we will really see. There's a question there. Well, you know, we have a, um, a real problem. I mean, I think the government-backed lending is predominantly the housing market, and it is absolutely true. I, you know, whatever you read, whether it's 75, 80, 95 percent, but it's a, an incredible percentage of all the housing lending now is the GSEs. That is unsustainable um, if you are not going to have a, a fourth uh, division of the government. Uh, and um, this may not be a very popular suggestion, uh, but I think sooner or later the government's going to figure out that we need to return mortgage lending to the private sector, and that means um, uh, having a mortgage market which is similar, for example, to Canada. Now, I'm going to quote a statistic uh, with the understanding that the three types of lies are lies, damn lies, and statistics. But Canada has a percentage of home ownership which is basically equal to that in the United States. Now, that's, I think, an exaggeration because Canada also doesn't have our urban areas. So um, that, that really isn't right. But it's still a very large uh, home ownership in Canada. Uh, 
yet Canada has a mortgage system that works. If you don't pay your mortgage, you're personally liable. Uh, you uh, can't get a mortgage unless you can put 75% down. Uh, uh, the mortgage rate floats. Uh, it has a 10-year maturity and so on. And the answer or the concern with what I've suggested is that's going to leave a lot of people unable to get mortgages. That is true, but that doesn't mean they can't because that's where the government can subsidize and can come in and do what its mission really should be if we're going to subsidize mortgages, which I think makes a fair, quite a fair amount of sense because of the dream of home ownership. Let's do it for the people who need it rather than have a total subsidization for everybody uh, who um, wants a mortgage. Yes. I, it's a, the, the question is something I think all of us should be worried about. I think we are near the tipping point now. I don't think we are there yet, um, but this is why it is so critical that the regulatory apparatus not take the laws, which where they have a lot of flexibility, and make them even more stringent. And. Uh, let me give you an example. I'll come back to Basel III. One I haven't mentioned was there are actually two liquidity requirements. When I referred to the shortfall, that was what's known as the LCR, the, uh, the short-term 30-day liquidity requirement. There's also one, a one-year requirement, and that one was so uh, misbegotten when it was proposed that Basel acknowledged it and took it back off the table, but it's coming back. If that one comes out anything like the original proposal, uh, the net, what's known as the net stable funding ratio, that could really have a problem because now it would force uh, uh, banks out of, the, out of the lending market and, and much more into very highly liquid assets. So again, I don't think we're there today but we're not far away. And once you tip, you just don't know where it untips. Yes. I think there is a very real danger. I think this goes back to the <coughs> political point. I mean, why would you have a 10-person council, um, but everybody had to be satisfied? And there is a danger, and I think this is going to d depend highly on whether, uh, because we usually have quite prominent people uh, and, and, and skilled leaders whether now the Secretary Geithner, Secretary Geithner and Chairman Bernanke really take leadership uh, positions. And if they do, uh, I think their positions in the government uh, will enable them to really mold uh, the so-called FSOC. I, I think but the- But the design of the committee itself is sort of all 60? Uh, all, everybody gets a vote. Uh, it's chaired by the Treasury. But I do, th and I don't think this is a bad thing, at least what I have been told is, because a number of these positions are either not filled or are soon to come open, and a question which is asked when references are checked, is this person a team player? So I have, I have some, politics aren't always bad, sometimes they're good, and, and that type of question I think will get there. But, but you know, the basic thrust of your question is right. This is, 
Um, you know, it, it's as if, uh, I guess we go into the uh, Breeders' Cup uh, Saturday, and it's uh, if you tried to construct, instead of Senyata, you constructed a camel to run, um, you, you, you know, it would, it, it's not the perfect construction, but I think uh, with the right jockey, we can get it over the finish line. <laughs> One last question. Okay, well, I, I, I will accept that I may have understated the likelihood. It may be zero instead of 1%, but you know, I, 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 look, I agree basically with what you're saying there. And I think this next 18 months is perhaps the most dangerous period because it will not, we, we, the FDIC, which has this resolution authority, is not institutionally ready to get there. But I think that they understand the basic uh, process and what they've been saying so far, I think, is uh, the right way to go. And the only way you, I think, can do it because you're never going to figure out the future is to back test and see what would have happened. That's not the an total answer, but at least it gives some guidance. So let's take a Lehman. What would have happened is that immediately all of Lehman would have been put into a bridge. Uh, the Treasury, first there would have been, I think what would have happened then is the Treasury would have guaranteed dip financing from the private sector, uh, debtor in possession financing, and creditors, uh, all, it's, it's, again, it, it's a good meld of bankruptcy and, um, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Act. Uh, there would have been preference clawbacks, so the people who got out would be returning the money. And then the most important part, which I think is not well understood, is that what the FDIC would handle this like they handle a failed bank where they can't get somebody to take the uninsured depositors. You immediately could come in with a claim if you were a creditor. The FDIC would make an estimate and let's assume that it's 85, 90, 95 cents on the dollar, and you would immediately get a check for that amount of money. And the immediacy and certainty of getting paid is what I think ends, or hopefully ends, contagion. Again, your question is right on, because there is an inevitable tension, an inherent tension, between eliminating contagion and eliminating too big to fail. And I think this is as close as you can get. Well, the money market is a whole different issue, and I think that's something which has conveniently been forgotten as to that industry almost going under without a government guarantee. And this goes back to how is FSOC going to deal with the money market funds, if at all? Right. This was wonderful. <laughs>
trauma surgeon, um, it actually strikes me as a neurosurgeon. Um, mm -hmm. This is, was quite a lecture, and I want to th thank you again and invite, as Michael did, all of you out for um, cocktails outside where you can follow up with more questions. Thank you. <laughs>